Hi everyone, my name is Mahek Mohan. I am a senior studying MCB, and it is an absolute honor to welcome Dr. Downa to our class. I had the privilege of working in her lab for two years, and it was one of the most formative experiences for me. Uh, she's an absolutely incredible woman and professor. If you haven't had the opportunity to learn a little bit about her, she has pioneered the space of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technologies, and amongst other things, she has written a book called The Crack in Creation, where she goes through her experiences of this whole scientific journey. She's given a TED Talk, which is really informative. I would highly recommend it. She's won a numerous, uh, numerous prizes, including uh, the NSF's Under 35 Award, which they actually had to change because it was such an incredible award that no one under 35 was getting it. And so she has had a wonderful, wonderful um, track record with uh, showing the world how informative and amazing this technology can be in disrupting the scientific innovation space. She's also started numerous companies, and her recent one, Mammoth Biosciences, is pioneering the point of care disease detection space. So we are so, so lucky and honored to have Dr. Downa talk to our class today. So please help me in welcoming her here. Well, thank you, Mahek, for that generous introduction. And good evening, everyone. I am appreciative of Vicki and the uh, team here for the invitation to come and talk to you. I feel like I'm kind of behind this barrier. It's odd to come out here. And uh, I thought what we could do tonight is I just want to share with you some science that has been going on in my lab here at Berkeley for the last close to a decade and um, how science that started off as curiosity-driven research morphed into something very different and has taken me on a journey of entrepreneurship that I, believe me, never thought I would be uh, doing. And, um, and it's been incredibly fun and exciting. And there have been some you know, bumps on the road, of course. There always are. But, uh, but you know, I've learned a lot along the way. And I hope that what I can do is, over the next 45 minutes or so, share a bit about our story, our science, and the technology that is driving um, opportunities to move in areas of human health, agriculture, and synthetic biology that it, are, are really very exciting. And then I want to open it up to your questions and have more of a conversation with all of you. So to get us rolling, I thought I would start off by talking a bit about the science that I started working on about 10 years ago at Berkeley that um, really got us launched in this exciting direction of genome editing. And it started with something that none of us at the time imagined would go in the direction that it did. And this is really an effort to study something seemingly very um, obscure, which was how bacteria fight viral infection. This is a picture of a bacterial cell that's being infected by virus particles, and when this infection occurs, the virus literally injects DNA into the cell that contains the program to make viruses. That's sort of the course of a viral infection. And so in a bacterial cell, the bacterium has about 20 minutes to find and destroy the virus before it gets killed itself. And so it's a strong selective pressure for pathways that can provide protection. And it was through studying a new process for bacterial immunity that uh, the whole area of CRISPR technology came about. And it started with scientists who were doing uh, some interesting research in the environment. This is a picture from, uh, taken from Northern California, a colleague of ours here at Berkeley, Jillian Banfield, whose laboratory works on studying microbes in their native environments. And this is a picture of members of her lab uh, going out to sites up in Northern California and co collecting soil and water samples that are put in these little tubes. And they mark very carefully the locations where they're coming from. They come back to the lab and extract DNA from those samples and sequence the DNA to figure out what kinds of microbes are growing in those environments. And the result is that they uncover all kinds of evidence for bacteria and other single-celled organisms that are growing out in these environments. They've typically never been identified by scientists before. They've never been cultured in the laboratory. 
And from our perspective, they contain a lot of interesting genes and pathways that give us clues about how these bugs live and how they interact with their, uh, their neighbors out, out in these environmental settings. And it was through the, this type of research, doing this kind of analysis of microbes, that Jillian Banfield and a few, just a few, a handful of scientists back in the mid-2000s figured out that bacteria have an adaptive immune system that helps them fight viruses. And nobody had seen this before. It hadn't come to anyone's, um, anyone's attention. But what revealed the presence of this immune system was DNA sequences in the bacterial genomes that uh, contain pieces of DNA from viruses. And I'll show you, I want to show you a cartoon of how these adaptive immune systems work. And this is a cartoon showing the plasma membrane of a bacterium and a virus that's landed on the surface and it's a, um, in the process of injecting its DNA into the cell during infection. And if this lucky cell has a CRISPR adaptive immune system in the genome, then it's able to detect that foreign DNA and grab a little piece of it that gets integrated into the bacterial chromosome. And it goes in not randomly, but it goes in to a place called the CRISPR locus, which you can see right here in this cartoon, contains a very distinctive pattern of DNA repeats, the black diamonds signify a repetitive DNA sequence that occurs over and over, and in between the repeats, these bits of viral DNA. And they're quite short, they're about 30, 30 base pairs, or 30 DNA letters long in each case, but they provide a genetic memory of viral infection. And so what happens next is that the cell is able to make a little throwaway copy of that CRISPR locus in the form of molecules of RNA that contain the viral sequences. Those RNA molecules are chopped into shorter bits that each include just one virally derived sequence. And those RNAs then combine with proteins encoded by CRISPR-associated, or Cas genes, to provide the zip codes that direct those proteins to destroy viral DNA should it show up in the cell. And that's shown right here. And so the, the RNA molecule contains a sequence of letters that matches the letters in the virus, in the viral DNA. And that's really how the recognition works in this system. So it's, you know, some really interesting, really kind of cool biology for how bacteria are interacting with their, um, their neighbors and importantly with their, uh, in their invaders in the environment. And, uh, and so how did I get into, involved in this? Well, Jill Banfield, um, you know, being very, um, a very savvy scientist, when she saw these CRISPR sequences in a lot of her bacterial genomes that they were sequencing in her lab, she wondered whether this was in fact representing a bacterial immune system that nobody had identified at the time. And her lab doesn't do the kind of experimental work that would be needed to test that idea. But she reached out to me because she knew that I was a biochemist uh, who works on RNA molecules and how they are involved in controlling the flow of genetic information in cells. And when she contacted me, we started meeting up. We met at first uh, at the Free Speech Movement Cafe right here at Berkeley and looked at her data. And I got excited. I got intrigued. I thought this seemed like a really interesting thing to study. And so we began to investigate the molecules that might be involved in this adaptive immune pathway. And that led to, an, eventually, to a collaboration with another scientist named Emmanuel Charpentier, a scientist in Sweden who I met at a conference. And we teamed up to figure out the function of a particularly interesting protein that was part of adaptive immunity in certain kinds of bacteria, a protein known as Cas9, a very kind of, you know, not very descriptive name. But it was interesting because genetics had suggested that Cas9 was the one protein necessary to protect cells that had it from viral infection. And so the question that we asked experimentally was, how does Cas9 work? And that revealed that Cas9 is a protein that has the ability to interact with DNA using its RNA guide, the RNA coming from that CRISPR array. And, um, and it recognizes DNA by opening up the double helix and leading to a double-stranded DNA break that gets introduced in the DNA at a place dictated by the site 
where the RNA molecule in Cas9 is interacting. And that's shown in this cartoon right here. So it's a double-stranded DNA cleaver that uses the RNA as the zip code, the way of detecting the place in the DNA that should be cut. So in bacteria, this would be operating to detect viral DNA and allow Cas9 to make a, a double-stranded break that triggers DNA degradation. So it's a way that bacteria can destroy those viral DNA molecules before they have time to overtake the cell. But when we did this initial research, um, and this was done by two fabulous uh, scientists in our labs, uh, Martin Jinek, uh, who was a postdoctoral scientist working in my lab here at Berkeley, and Chris Chylinski, a graduate student who was working in Emmanuel Charpentier's lab. These guys figured out that uh, not only how this protein works and how it makes a double-stranded DNA cut, but they also realized that they could simplify it compared to what nature had done. So in nature, this is a protein that requires not just one, but two separate kinds of RNA molecules that are shown here in this cartoon. They're called CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA. And you have to have both for this double-stranded cutting mechanism to work. But what Martin and Christoph figured out was that they could actually combine those RNA molecules into a single type of RNA that we called the single guide RNA that would provide the zip code information as well as the ability to assemble efficiently with the Cas9 protein. And when Martin Jinek did those experiments, those key experiments in my lab to show that he could make this single guide RNA and use it to program Cas9 to find and cut a desired DNA sequence, that was when we looked at each other and said, holy smokes, this is, this is going to be a really amazing technology because it's a, it's a protein that can be controlled and triggered to cleave DNA at, uh, at, at, at any place in a DNA molecule, even a DNA molecule as large as a whole chromosome in a, in a cell. Now, why, why, did we, why, did we, why did we think that? Well, it's because of all of the research that had gone on previously to show that in cells like ours, like human cells, but also other kinds of animal and plant cells, when DNA is broken in a double-stranded break, instead of triggering rapid destruction, like what happens typically in bacteria, which are very rapidly growing cells, in these slower growing cells, a double-stranded DNA break instead triggers the cell to repair the break. And, um, and there are specific pathways that will recognize a double-stranded DNA break and fix the break by making a um, sealing up the ends and in the process, sometimes triggering a change to the DNA sequence. And that change could be very small, such as in the example on the left, or the change could be larger by involving in insertion of a whole new segment of genetic material, a big, bigger piece of DNA that goes in to seal up the gap. And so a number of scientists had been, uh, had been you know, studying this process, and, and this had led to some earlier technologies for genome engineering that involved using engineered proteins that could be designed in the laboratory to bind to DNA sequences and generate a double-stranded break that would trigger this kind of DNA repair. And those, those technologies called zinc finger nucleases and talon proteins, if you've heard of those, they're actually uh, proteins that can work very well for genome engineering and were exciting to scientists because they showed that you could make targeted changes to the genetic code in cells and you could change the properties of cells that are encoded by that information. So there's a lot of buzz in the scientific community about this. But the technologies themselves were just hard enough to use that most labs hadn't been able to get their hands on them or, or really make use of them. They, were, uh, they required a lot of expertise about how to engineer proteins, and you had to know how to you know, design these things and test them, and for each experiment, each change you might want to make to DNA in a cell, you had to make different, a different set of engineered proteins, and that was just hard enough to do that most scientists in most labs hadn't adopted the technology. And the beautiful thing about this CRISPR immune system is that nature had already figured this out. Nature had already figured out that you could use the same protein over and over and over to cut DNA at different positions by simply changing 
this little transient RNA molecule that provides the zip code, the address, the letters where it goes to make a cut. And once we understood that process, we recognized that we could plug it in to this pathway for DNA repair, and it would be a powerful way to trigger changes in cells that would be easy for people to use. And I'm gonna show you a, a little video that illustrates how we imagine that this system operates in, uh, when it gets into a plant or an animal cell. And so here we're looking at a, at a cell, and um, it's uh, got DNA inside the nucleus, so we're zooming in uh, towards the nucleus where the DNA is hanging out. And in our cells, for example, in plants and animals, lots of DNA, it's compacted into the nucleus, so it's the DNA, which is blue in this um, image, is wrapped around histone proteins, which are shown in green, so it really compacts the, the genome. And what Cas9 does is it searches through all of that DNA, even though it's wrapped up and packaged in this uh, very tight fashion, and it finds a place in the sequence that matches the letters in the guide RNA. And when that happens, it unwinds the DNA, it makes a double-stranded DNA break, and then it hands those broken ends of the DNA off to DNA repair enzymes that come in and fix the gap. And this is an artist's rendition, and not scientifically accurate here, but imagining how the repair happens in this example with insertion of a new segment of DNA in the process of fixing the double-stranded break. And, um, and so Emmanuel Charpentier and I published a paper about our initial work on Cas9 in the summer of 2012. And um, we, we wrote a paper that basically described the biochemical activity of Cas9 as a double-stranded DNA cleaving enzyme, and also how it could be programmed using this single guide that we proposed as a new technology for inducing double-stranded breaks that would trigger uh, genome editing. And what happened next was truly, truly phenomenal. And I, I sort of knew when we published this paper that you know, it would be like firing the, the starting gun at a race, right? Because you know, in science, when published you know, articles are, are put out into the scientific literature, other scientists read those papers and that will often stimulate their thinking and the way that they're conducting research in their labs. And in this case, this tool that we proposed for genome editing was just simple enough that a lot of labs said, read this paper and said, oh, I want to try that in my system. And so what happened was a, a, a number of labs and in increasing numbers over time started to adopt this technology for genome editing in all kinds of cells. And in fact, before the end of 2012, before the end of that year, there were seven papers, think about it, seven papers had been submitted to scientific journals from different groups, including ours here at Berkeley, showing that you could use CRISPR-Cas9 to make targeted changes to the genomes of human cells, plant cells, bacteria, of course, as well as um, whole organisms. And the first whole organism that was edited using CRISPR-Cas9 was a fish, a zebra fish. And, and so it, it, this was just uh, absolutely amazing. And many people in the scientific community started to recognize that this technology was really, truly t transformative because it put into the hands of all of us who knew a little bit about molecular biology a tool that we could use to do something very profound, which was to alter the code of life, alter the code that controls all of the properties that we see in living systems, including in humans. Now, this is a chart that um, was uh, posted by a, by a journal, the Elsevier uh, Publishing uh, House, that publishes a number of scientific journals, including the journal Cell and all the sort of cell family journals. And this just shows the different technologies for genome editing and the impact they had on, public, on scientific publications. And this just gives you a sense of what was happening in the scientific community. So you can see some of these earlier technologies for genome editing, the first one called meganuclease, and then zinc finger nucleases, ZFNs and talons. These all uh, stimulated some degree of activity and public, you know, papers that were published in the literature that used those technologies. But when the CRISPR-Cas9 
work was published in 2012, you can see that immediately there was a, uh, an uptick in scientific articles that began to be published using that technology, and the growth has been exponential. And you know what? Seven years later, it still is. So if you go to PubMed and plot out the papers published in uh, scientific journals using CRISPR-Cas9 technology, it's still, we're still seeing exponential growth of the use of the technology. So it gives you a sense of kind of the incredible excitement in the scientific world about this opportunity to control the code of life in cells and do all kinds of experiments that many scientists had wanted to do, they just didn't have a way to do it in the past. And so then where, where does that bring us with respect to entrepreneurship? So for me, at the time, you know, working uh, in the lab on this, on this technology, and I was, you know, very excited about all of the opportunities scientifically that, uh, that we could see in front of us using this tool. And in my lab, you know, we've always been a lab that does fundamental research. So we were curious about how this works. We wanted to understand how is it that, you know, in that little video I showed you, how does that work? Somehow it does, you know, this protein is able to search through three billion base pairs in the human genome to find 20 letters, 20 base pairs. How does it do that? It's an incredible thing. So, and we're still studying that today. So we continued to do a lot of that fundamental work. But at the same time, um, I recognized that, you know, there were going to be some opportunities to use this technology to solve real problems that would be very difficult to do in an academic setting. If we wanted to, for example, um, try to work on curing a, a genetic disease and bringing this technology to a point where it could actually be used in a doctor's office, that's something that would be very difficult to do in an academic lab. Why? Well, you need a lot of money, a lot more than we would have in an academic lab, and you need a lot of experts that know things that we don't know how to do, and we need doctors, and we need clinical teams, and we need uh, people that know how to run clinical trials, and we need people that know how to talk to the Food and Drug Administration, and we need people who know how to make molecules that can be safely injected into a person, and all of those kinds of things. And so that's where, uh, that's where I started thinking about um, ways that we could get involved in advancing the technology for those kinds of applications, and it seemed much more appropriate to do that in the context of companies. And lo and behold, I had a wonderful uh, student in my lab around that time, a gal named Rachel Harwitz, who was doing her PhD at Berkeley. Um, this was actually, she was actually working a little bit before uh, the Cas9 work was actually published, but we were already studying uh, CRISPR systems and CRISPR pathways. And, you know, in addition to doing research in the lab, she was also taking courses at, here at Berkeley Haas Business School. And when, uh, when I heard that, I said, gee, it sounds like you might be interested in going into business. And she said, yes. And I said, well, you know, I think there could be some really interesting things to do with these CRISPR uh, proteins. Do you think we should start a company? And without even batting an eye, she said, of course. And so we founded a little company called Caribou Biosciences. And this was the first company that I had ever been a founder of. And literally, Rachel Harwitz and I got on BART, and we went over to San Francisco, and we went to a law office over there, and we walked in and we said, we wanted to, we want to uh, incorporate a company. And they said, oh, that sounds great, and what's your idea? And we sat down and we said, here's what we want to do. And they said, oh, this sounds very interesting. And they said, what's the name of your company? And I said, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What's the, I said, Rachel, what's the name of our company? And she said, well, how about we call it Caribou? And it comes from... The CA is from CAS, like CAS proteins. Ribo is for ribonucleic acid, because these proteins work with RNA. And then we needed to turn it into a word, so caribou. And uh, it also had the opportunity to create a really cool little logo here, like you can see, um, that has antlers that look a lot like the uh, way that we like to draw RNA molecules in the lab. And so we thought that was kind of fitting. And so Caribou got founded in, uh, actually in 2011, but really got going the following year in 2012, the year that we published the work on Cas9. And, uh, and so, you know, we started to think about all of the ways that you could use genome editing to solve real world problems. And these included, you know, aspects of research. So our initial conception of Caribou was actually as a research company. We thought, thought, of, it, thought of it as a company that would be 
developing this technology and turning it into a really robust way that you could quickly do things like discover uh, genes that were involved in cancer pathways or discover genes that were um, you know, responsible for genetic diseases and things like that. And then, uh, of course, you know, that sort of brings you immediately to human health because if you think, well, I'm going to use it as a research tool and then what I discover with my research tool is that I've got these genes that are causing disease, but now I can take that tool that I used in the research and actually, actually use it as the therapeutic to correct the problem. So that was where you know, sort of the human health ideas came in. And then finally, and I didn't mention this before, but you know, one of the things that's so powerful about this genome editing technology is that it works in every type of cell. And that means that we're not limited to using it in biomedical applications, but there are also enormous opportunities in agriculture to make changes to plants that give plants traits that will make them useful and beneficial in different environments, whether it's to help them to be drought tolerant, to be tolerant or resistant to pests, to be uh, less requiring of fertilizers, to be more nutritious, you know, sort of anything you could think of, right? Bear higher yields of fruits, you know, things like that. And so there are just enormous opportunities there. And so we started to think about all these things in the context of this little tiny company, uh, Caribou. And of course, initially, it was just myself and Rachel. And then we ultimately pulled in two other co-founders from Berkeley who were uh, also people working actively in this area that could help bring their expertise to bear on crafting this company. And um, this is just, I was just going to show you a few slides that, that just sort of discuss what we imagined in those early days to be some of the impacts from the technology. And you know, we were trying to think about you know, how do you create a company that's going to capitalize on these opportunities and, and be effective at turning this powerful tool into something that can actually solve some of these real world problems. Um, and so this is just showing you that you know, in it, the human therapeutics, you, know, you can imagine lots of ways that you could use a genome editing tool as a therapeutic opportunity in humans. Agricultural uh, um, you know, opportunities, same thing, right? Ways that you could change plants to make them more useful, to make them more valuable. And then finally, um, also thinking about microbial engineering. So we're really hitting all the you know, sort of important areas of um, commercial opportunity, but also areas of biology that were clearly going to be uh, hugely impacted by having this easy tool for genome editing. And again, just to, just to reiterate, so this is, a, again, this was actually a cartoon that we used in our very early, uh, one of our first publications on, on CRISPR-Cas9 that just described how it works as an RNA-guided DNA cleaver, and using this single-guide RNA, we can create double-stranded breaks at any desired position in the genome of an organism to allow changes to be made to the DNA of that cell and ultimately to, uh, if, if the cell is a proliferating cell in, in the cells of an entire tissue or even uh, an entire animal or plant. Um, and so, you know, we can think about this in the context of, and this is again how we thought about it in those early days with caribou, of being one of the tools in this kind of, uh, really critical toolbox that biologists have in their hands to do things that have been incredibly valuable. So going, if we go back to the origin of kind of the, what we consider kind of the beginning of the biotech era, you know, it kind of happened right here in the Bay Area, right? Genentech is really considered one of the early, maybe the first, one of the first you know, sort of biotech companies that really started to capitalize and commercialize on fundamental science that was coming out of research laboratories back in the 1970s. And that really came about largely because of some of these earlier uh, technologies that included restriction enzymes, which allow scientists to cut out pieces of DNA and put them into other pieces of DNA and make copies of genes and things like that, very useful ways of, of um, producing ultimately the gene products, which are proteins in industrial settings. The polymerase chain reaction, again, a technology that allowed amplification of DNA. You could make lots of copies of DNA molecules very easily. So that was another very enabling technology. And then, of course, DNA 
sequencing and you know, all of the uh, genomic sequencing that's going on right now you know, is very, very enabling if, if we have a way to act on that information. So all of these earlier uh, technologies, importantly, they all had to do with DNA, and they all had to do with being able to copy genes, cut and paste genes, um, read the DNA sequence of genes. But what was missing was a tool that would allow scientists to actually change genes, right? Change them in a targeted way and do that accurately, quickly, easily, simply, cheaply, you know, not requiring big teams of scientists that had lots of specialized expertise, but that would just put into the hands of, you know, any student who came into the lab uh, a tool that they could use to change DNA in a targeted fashion. And that's really what genome editing is all about. That's why it's such a powerful and important technology. And so, you know, and I, I said this already, so I won't belabor this. You know, again, it's the principle is that DNA is being cut and then triggered to, triggering the cell to make a, a targeted change to it. Caribou Biosciences um, began to work on this technology and improve it and, and apply it in different ways. And this is just showing some of the milestones along the way. So Rachel Harwitz, this former student of mine, founder of Caribou, became the president and CEO of the company. She still is today, the president and CEO of Caribou. And um, Caribou initially started with just uh, you know, friends and family money. So we scraped, literally scraped together a little bit of money so that we could hire Rachel into the company and pay her a wage, not a very high wage, but a wage. And, um, and then we also applied for government grants. So we applied for uh, small business innovation research grants called SBIRs. We got two of those. And it's sort of like free money the government gives to new companies to help them get started. And so we, got, we fortunately got two of those grants that helped us to hire a couple of more people. And then um, eventually in 2014, we actually closed uh, series A, which I think probably everyone here, you're familiar with this, right? You've talked about this, but basically this is a company's initial uh, sort of first round of investor funding. And um, at the same time, Rachel Harwitz started to be recognized externally um, for her skills in steering this little tiny company into a, a, a firm that was starting to be known out in the outside world as a company that was one of the very first to be commercializing the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And so she got the Forbes on 30 Under 30 uh, recognition, and she got some other awards that you know, really started to put her on the map in the business world as someone who was a young, rookie, but successful uh, entrepreneur. And then uh, the company actually founded another company. So the decision was made to spin out all of the technology needed for human therapeutics into a separate company because, you know, I think Rachel rightly recognized that it would be very difficult to do lots of different kinds of applications of genome editing in the same company. You needed different types of people to do that. And so they started a company called Intellia Therapeutics uh, out of Boston with some venture capital firms in Boston, including um, Atlas Ventures. And so that company was founded uh, with an initial by these today's standards, it sounds like a tiny Series A, $15 million. Um, but uh, that was enough money to hire a team, rent a commercial space, and begin putting in place all of the tools and, and people, et cetera, that you would need to actually develop genome editing into a therapy. That company now is a publicly traded company, and its market cap is north of a billion dollars. So. You know, it started small and it grew very big, very quick. Um, and then, of course, you know, there were opportunities along the way to do multiple corporate partnerships, the biggest of which for Caribou was actually a partnership with DuPont uh, Pioneer, which is one of the big agricultural companies. And they were able to work together to develop CRISPR-Cas9 as a technology and for, uh, that was useful in, um, in plants. Um, you know, I won't say too much about this. Uh, you know, the, the, one of the big challenges of the technology, and it still is today, is figuring out how to deliver it, how to deliver the editing molecules into different kinds of cells. And these are just some strategies that are being used scientifically. You can use 
uh, DNA to encode the molecules for editing. You can use RNA molecules to encode uh, uh, the, the Cas9 protein, or you can use a preformed protein RNA complex that we call a ribonucleoprotein, or RNP, to deliver directly into cells. And companies have taken uh, different strategies here. Caribou itself has been working on um, more of the sort of the pre-assembled protein RNA complex uh, kind of strategy. And, um, and they've also, the company has also been very interested in developing their own versions of CRISPR-Cas9 that would be um, patented by the company, and those patents would then be owned by the company so that they would have their own in-house suite of patent-protected technology that they could use in different kinds of applications. I'll say more about that uh, in a moment, but I just wanted to mention that along the way, Rachel was able to hire into the company a series of people who were quite experienced in the business world. And this is, um, this is a fairly recent slide that shows some of the folks on that team, including um, the scientific, uh, chief scientific officer, Steve Kanner, who had a lot of experience working in biotech prior to coming to Caribou, and he'd actually done a lot of work that was highly relevant to the kinds of molecules that Caribou works with. Uh, Timothy Herpin, who's the chief business officer, and again, he had been at uh, various kinds of companies, large and small, including a large pharmaceutical company, so he knew a lot about uh, building a good business plan for a group like this. Barbara McClung, uh, chief legal officer, who had been at um, a number of companies prior to coming to Caribou, very experienced in dealing with some of the legal issues that come up when you have a company like this that's getting going, et cetera. So a uh, great team of people. And um, in terms of technology, the uh, CRISPR uh, group, the scientific team at Caribou, began working on ways of developing the technology so that it would be suitable to ultimately use as a, uh, as a very accurate tool for changing sequences in whether, they were, whether it was happening in human cells or in plant cells, you want the cha these changes to be accurate. And again, I won't uh, belabor this, but I just want to point out that um, they've been consistently working on developing ways that would be uh, proprietary to Caribou, writing the patents that would be needed to protect those, those uh, developments of the technology, and then working with appropriate partners to use these tools in different uh, kinds of commercial opportunities. And these are some of the capabilities of the platform right now, whether it's molecular engineering, cellular engineering, um, genotyping, meaning, meaning figuring out the cohort of genes that give rise to certain traits, phenotyping, figuring out what the products of genes are and how they affect uh, the properties of organisms, and, um, of course, pharmacology and then process development is just the way that these molecules could actually be developed for actual uh, use in the clinic or use in plants. And, um, you know, I think there continue to be huge opportunities, but, of course, challenges in these areas. And um, these are, you know, these are, you know, some of the types of areas where now multiple CRISPR companies are operating. And one of the things that all of these companies have had to deal with, well, let me just mention a few, and maybe this, we can discuss this more in the questions, but one is the patent landscape. Very complicated for CRISPR-Cas, okay? So that's one of the challenges. Second is ethics. Lots of issues have arisen around the ethical use of genome editing, especially in humans and especially in human embryos. So that's been an area where companies have had to pay attention because they have to think about how their products will be viewed ultimately by customers, and they want to be functioning in an ethical fashion. So they've had to think about that, even if that's not the type of work they're doing, which none of them are, to my knowledge, but you know, they, have to, they still have to be part of that conversation. Um, and then, of course, just the, the normal challenges of figuring out how to you know, optimize the technology, pick the right kinds of commercial opportunities, partner with the right people, build the right teams, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so you know, this is really my last slide. And I just want to say this is kind of just circling back to the science. So for me, as a scientist, it's been incredibly interesting to see a technology that grew out of fundamental research we were doing in our lab right here at Berkeley grow into this incredibly exciting opportunity. And of course, there are many people involved in this. So I didn't 
talk about all of the other labs that contributed here tonight. I don't want you to get the sense this was all us, because it certainly wasn't, right? There's lots of other labs that have been contributing to this. It's been a very much a, a community effort. But, um, but, you know, our part of it has been, you know, for me, has really just been continuing to ask ourselves, how do we, how do we continue to contribute? How do we use the scientific skill set that, that I have and that we have in the lab to continue to advance the field, as well as to um, think about how we can help, for me especially, the students that are coming out of these programs who want to go into business to be successful? How do we help them to get access to the expertise and, and whatever else they need so that they can build successful companies. And I'm really happy that I've now um, been involved in quite a few uh, teams. This is just a picture of my group, and thanks to our, you know, our funders and our collaborators, um, I wanted to mention the Innovative Genomics Institute that I'm involved with, which is, again, an academic organization at Berkeley and UCSF. And finally, I just want to get to this slide, because this shows all of the companies that I'm now involved with in different ways. So I've now been involved in founding four of these companies, so Caribou, Editas, Intelia, and the newest that Mahek mentioned is Mammoth Biosciences, which is actually a company working on diagnostics that are based on CRISPR-Cas proteins. I'm a scientific advisory board member on some of those, plus a few others. And um, I'm now a director at a company called Johnson & Johnson that you might have heard of. And um, that's given me exposure to a very large, it's one of the largest international corporations, but it's also a very um, important pharmaceutical company. And that's given me a whole different insight into how a company like that has to operate, make decisions, et cetera, with publicly traded stock and all of the, um, you know, aspects of that, that that go along with running a business like that. So I'm going to stop there um, and thank you for your attention. And I'd love to just open the floor up to questions. Um, Dr. Doudna, I'm going to start us off. Uh, I don't know about everybody else, but there just seems to be a huge gap between us sitting in the audience and listening to you talk about everything that's been going on and everything that you're doing. And I just was wondering if you could maybe take us all the way back to those days where you might have been sitting into, in an audience listening to somebody um, and what you think now, knowing what you're doing, which is not just research, it's talking to the government, it's running uh, as a director, being responsible for making decisions in a lot of these companies. Um, what was it when you were sitting, uh, studying, in your, even your undergraduate days, that you feel was influential to what you're doing now? Well, I have to say, I think it was really just um, following my passion. I know it sounds very simple, but I think it was, for me, you know, when I was in your shoes, sitting in the seats that you're sitting in and studying and learning, I was just, you know, as I was a chemistry major in college, and I loved, but I loved the idea of applying chemistry to biology. So I was actually doing biochemistry. And I just, you know, I just loved, loved, loved doing science. And I loved working in the lab. And so I, I, I had no conception of anything that I talked to you about tonight. Believe me, I never imagined that my life would go in that direction. And I couldn't have even, you know, I couldn't have conceived of it at that time. I was really just thinking very... Uh, very locally about, you know, how do I, how do I do well on my next chemistry test? And, um, you know, and, and uh, what do I do if I didn't do well on my next chemistry test? And, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, where, do, where am I going to get a job this summer? And, you know, am I going to, um, you know, am I going to screw up on my next experiment in the lab? And, you know, things like that, right? And, and I think, but I think that's important because I think that it's, it's by paying attention to those smaller things and following your passion, figuring out who you are, as a person, what drives you, what, what gets you out of bed in the morning, what do you get excited about? Not what other people think you should be doing, because believe me, you know, I, I had a lot of people uh, when I was a student telling me, eh, not a lot of people, but you know, I had people, I had some telling me that, uh, you know, science wasn't, somebody told me science wasn't for girls, I heard that. Um, my grandfather told me, you know, why, why do you, when I started graduate school, my grandfather wanted to know why wasn't I going to be a real doctor? I was wasting my time getting a PhD, so I heard that. 
Um, you know, and then all kinds of people who were naysayers about things that I was doing in the lab, you know, who would tell me, oh, that experiment will never work, or that's not an interesting problem, or, you know, all kinds of that kind of naysaying. So there was always that going on. But I always looked for people that would be supportive, you know, people that would um, encourage me. And they came in all flavors. You know, my French teacher in college was actually surprisingly, maybe, very supportive of me uh, not switching my major to French, as I had gone to ask her about doing, but told me, no, no, you should stick with chemistry. <laughs> you know, and we had a great conversation about why she thought that. And, uh, you know, just lots and lots of people who um, were there for me when I had, you know, as we all do, doubts about what you're doing, um, you know, test doesn't go well, or you don't, you know, so experiment doesn't work, or you don't get the job you wanted, or, you know, things like that. Um, or there when, when good things happened, right? When those things went right, too. So I think looking for people that will support you in what you want to do is equally important to having, you know, just figuring out what your passions are and being doggedly, you know, insistent about pursuing them. Do you want to ask um, one of the questions that we had from online? Uh, sure, I can, or someone can. Sure, oh. so what did you want to be when you, well, when you grew up, when you were little? Say, say again? What did you want to be when you grew up, when you were little? Well, you know, when I was little, um, I, I, I didn't really think too much about it. I mean, I, I, you know, I probably wanted to be a fireman, or I don't know. I don't know what I wanted to be when I was really young. But um, when I was in about 10th grade in high school, um, you know, I, I realized that I really liked math and, and science. And um, I liked reading, too. I did a lot of reading and writing. But, you know, my dad was a literature professor but at the University of Hawaii. But... Um, but I, you know, I really liked math and, and science. And one day, I took, uh, we were, at, in high school, we were made to take a uh, vocational aptitude battery uh, test. I don't know if anybody's had to do that. ASVAB, if you had to, I don't know, this probably doesn't exist anymore. But we had to do this thing. And so we got a score, you know, uh, on this test. And you, you were supposed to look at your score on a bunch of different aspects of the test. And it would tell you what you you know, could potentially do when you grew up, right? And I looked at my score, and the top thing for me was civil engineering. I had not a clue what that was. I had no idea. Civil engineering? What the hell is that? I had no idea. Um, and so, so but, I, but it got me thinking, right? It got me thinking, gosh, the test thinks that I could be a scientist. And it had never occurred to me before, you know? And I started thinking, gee, I wonder if I could be, I wonder if I could be a scientist. And then I started thinking, well, if I were a scientist, what kind of a scientist would I be? And, you know, and I started thinking about different things. And I realized that what I was most excited about was, you know, I loved chemistry, but I really liked chemistry of life. Like, I was fascinated by DNA, you know, amazing. I mean, it was incredible to me that, you know, I'd look around my, you know, just the environment in Hawaii and see all these really amazing uh, plants and animals. And I realized, no, they all, they all look that way because they've all evolved through their DNA to have these different properties. And I, I don't know, just it, it, was, it was very interesting. So I think for me, it really was back in high school that I started imagining you know, going into science. But I couldn't have imagined any of this, right? And I never thought about, actually never thought about being an academic scientist. I just thought, oh, I just wanted to do stuff in the lab. You know, that's kind of, it was very simple for me. It's just, I, I liked it working in the lab. <laughs> Um, you all seem so dumbfounded, but we've had some interesting questions. Keep on thinking of those questions. Raise those hands. Don't but be somebody shy. had a question. Oh, over here. And the person who had a black hole question, see if you want to ask that actually out loud. <laughs> hey. Um, Would you introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Okay. Hey, um, my name Hi. is Yotam. Thank you so, so much for uh, coming and speaking to us tonight. So you briefly talked about the challenges uh, that this technology is facing, and I would like to just get a little more insight on the ethics of, of CRISPR and see what are some of the biggest ethical challenges that it's facing, and how do you think that these challenges could be dealt with um, and combated to, to, so, so this technology can move forward? Yeah, so, so he's asking about ethical challenges to, to, with CRISPR, and, and, and how, how do we, how do, how, how's the field sort of dealing with that, and, and how, are, how are we managing that, that discussion? And, and I see three major challenges, and there's probably lots of minor ones too, but the three biggies that I see right now, one is, um, is, is, um, is using 
gene editing in agriculture. Why is that ethical? Well, because people feel very strongly about their food, right? <laughs> Rightfully so. And you, know, and, and you can imagine that in addition to all of the wonderful things you could potentially do with plants and genome editing, there's also potentially harmful things that could be done, right? So there's, I think that's a challenge right there. It's just managing how the technology will be used agriculturally and also how it will be regulated. And different, you know, we, can, we, we don't, don't have to get into all of the details right now, but you know, different governments are regulating gene editing differently in plants. So that's creating challenges for companies to figure out you know, which markets they can work in, et cetera, right? So there's that. The second bucket I would put uh, for ethical challenges that I would, um, I would put out there is something called gene drives. This means um, using a gene editing tool like this that's very efficient to drive a genetic trait quickly through a population, for example, through a population of insects like mosquitoes. Lots of excitement about using this to create strains of mosquitoes that will not be able to spread disease. So that could be a very, very, very good thing for human health. But it also could create environmental challenges and damage. And so that creates an ethical challenge when you think about, you know, how do I weigh those, those, those things? Do I put, you know, human uh, health above, uh, you know, the health of bats or something that might be eating mosquitoes, you know, right? You have to think about that. So there's, there's that. And then the third one is one that I already mentioned, which maybe people here are familiar with because you might have seen it in the media because it gets a lot of media attention. And that's the whole topic of CRISPR babies, right? So the idea of using genome editing in the human germline to create heritable changes that will become part of a person's entire genetic makeup and be transmissible to their kids. So that's a you know, much more profound way of using it than treating one patient in a way that doesn't create a heritable change to their DNA. And so those three areas are um, all uh, you know, issues that companies have to be aware of, anybody, I think, you know, academics too, right? We all have to be grappling with this. And, um, and right now, there's a lot of effort to, uh, on the part of mostly scientific societies to put together guidelines and even requirements or, or even regulations that would stipulate how genome editing can be used in these different settings to avoid you know, some of the, the harm that, that they could cause. And it's an ongoing matter. So you know, the whole issue of CRISPR babies kind of came to a head last November when it was announced in, uh, in, in a, at a meeting in Hong Kong that a scientist had actually done this, and, and two uh, baby girls had been born with changes to their genomes that were created by CRISPR. And so this created, um, you know, kind of, I think, a, uh, you know, a, a bit of a crisis of, you know, the scientific community saying, you know, what do, how, do we, how are we going to manage this? And, um, and that's, you know, definitely an ongoing matter. Um, but it certainly is important that these issues are openly discussed, in my opinion, you know, that they're not swept under the rug, but that we, we talk about them, that we try to educate people broadly about this technology because it will affect all of our lives. It'll affect the kind of food that we have access to, the kind of medicines we're going to use in the future, the kind of diagnostics we'll be using. All of these things are going to be affected by genome editing, and so it's important for people to to know that this is coming down the pike. I saw a question over here, yeah. Um, for coming and for sharing your contributions to this technology and your path with it from academia yeah, to business, and I'm a public policy major, and so my question actually connects to the one before me, and I would be curious how you, both as a scientist and as an entrepreneur, navigate it in a practical sense, these ethical discussions, and how you engaged with the civil society and policymakers on creating these rules that we know we need to find in a democratic societal discourse. Yeah, well, it's been a process, you know, and I have to say I'm, I feel really, really grateful that I'm at this wonderful university, University of California, Berkeley, because uh, we have people on our campus, as you know, that are experts in all of these areas that I frankly knew nothing about, whether it was the law or, um, you know, or, or, or business, but also importantly, public policy. Um, you know, how we think about 
regulation and um, how different countries approach technology, how they, how they think about that. It's been really valuable, and I've gained a lot of, of, uh, of help. I've had a lot of help from colleagues here and students, et cetera, people who are, are thinking deeply about these different aspects and how they relate to uh, new technologies and how they relate in particular to genome editing. So that's been, been great. Um, but I think that um, you know it's it, it's it's definitely uh, uh, an evolving thing. So in the early days of, of CRISPR, um, I think many scientists were so you know frankly, and I, I understand it, they were so excited about the technology that they were just rushing ahead with experiments and publishing papers as fast as they could and filing patents and whatever they were doing, starting companies and all of that. Um, and and uh, you know for me. And I was doing that that too, you know. But but I also I also started to feel this sense a little bit of dread, you know, thinking that, you know, I knew that it would be possible, for example, to use this in human embryos. There was no scientific reason why it wouldn't work, and so it seemed likely that at some point somebody would do that. And I thought, you know, that is really going to cross an ethical line, and, or it could, you know. And so so I started, you know. I, I, I organized a small meeting in 2015 to discuss that topic, and that actually started the ball rolling and got the National Academies of Science involved in it, so that led to an international meeting on the topic. Uh, we just had the second international meeting, and that was the meeting in Hong Kong this, uh, just this last November. The third one is already planned for London in two years, so you know, it's, we now have a regular schedule of these. And in addition to that, a lot of other organizations started to get in you know, get involved in it and, and to, um, you know, hold meetings, write, write reports, hold public uh, discussions and things like that. And, um, and then, you know, of course, the, the, um, uh, it's been interesting to see how our government has gotten involved, right? So um, I think it was, yeah, probably around 2015 that I started to get contacted by uh, various government representatives, uh, you know, the senators and, and, and our own, you know, uh, in California. Uh, Jerry Brown called me twice, you know, called me twice um, here at Berkeley saying that, you know, he'd read some story, you know, about this and he wanted to know, you know, uh, first he wanted to know is this dangerous and then he wanted to know what are the business opportunities for California. <laughs> so, you know, it's good, right? It's, yeah. um, so, and then more, more, most recently, I was contacted by, um, by Senator Feinstein because her office is writing a, um, a resolution that will go to the Senate and will hopefully um, be something that would be adopted by other countries, which is basically resolving that using genome editing and human embryos for clinical use uh, should not be done right now, right, based on the state of the technology and the need to figure out the ethics of, of that kind of use. So, you know, her office has gotten involved. So, and it's very interesting, right? And I've now uh, been to Congress a few times and testified in front of the House and talked to senators and, you know, starting to, I think, there's just, you know, it's really uh, for them about understanding, you know, what is this? What is this thing? And they don't necessarily want me to tell them how it works, but, you know, they, they, they want to know, what it means, right? What does it mean that we can now use a genome editing tool and change genomes easily? You know, what, does that, what does that mean for, for our country? What does that mean for our competitiveness? What does that mean for, um, you know, for, for business? What does it mean for regulators? How do, how do policymakers approach this? Do they need to do anything or not, right? That's kind of one of the, the big debates right now is do we need more regulation or, or, or do we not? So, you know, all of that is very much an ongoing, uh, you know, discussion and I'm, I'm just one small piece of it. But I, I think most scientists, you know, don't like to get involved in those conversations because they, you know, they want to do the next experiment. They don't want to be um, they don't want to be kind of taken away from what they love doing. And I'm, I'm, I'm that way too, but I, I realized I had to, to get involved because it's a really, really important piece of, the, of, the, of the whole, this whole area of technology. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, say, I say some of the same things that I told you tonight. You know, I try to tell them that, uh, you know, there are several areas kind of broadly that I think this is going to be very impactful. Agriculture, for sure. Human medicine, for sure. Um, synthetic biology, sort of meaning all of the ways that you can now engineer organisms to be useful commercially. 
making useful chemicals, for example, biofuels, you know, things like that. So I tell them that. And, uh, and then I really, I try to listen and, and answer questions. And, and you know, one, it was very interesting. I, I was, uh, visited the Senate back in December, and, um, and the topic that, was, uh, that we discussed the most in that meeting, it might surprise you or it might not, um, but they actually wanted to know about cost because we were talking about how um, clinical trials to treat patients with sickle cell disease are going to be starting in the next, you know, probably the next 12 months or so. And, and many scientists think that we're, we're on the verge of having a cure for diseases like that. And so what these senators immediately understood was that, you know, that's going to be expensive, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost money, and yet it would be unethical to not offer something that is a cure to people that really need this and would be suffering without it. And so we had a really good discussion about, you know, how are we going to get from where we are today to a technology that's affordable and that, you know, can be provided to very broadly to um, people that need it. And, and, and frankly, that's not just in the U.S., right? That it's, an, it's an even bigger problem in other countries. But, you know, we need to be really thinking about this. And I was happy to know that that was something that they wanted to discuss. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, if I told you my troubles in the lab, we'd be here a really long time. <laughs> because, you know, science is never a straight, at least in my experience. Maybe it is for some people, but I doubt it. I think science is never a smooth path. You know, it's science, right? It's research. And for every experiment that, that works, there's probably 10 or 20 that didn't. And, and you know, ideas that, that didn't pan out and, you know, controls that failed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so... Um, you know, and in, in the case of CRISPR, I mean, definitely, you know, bumps in the road, you know, things that, things that didn't, didn't work, uh, you know, uh, a huge number of things that, 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 that didn't work. Um, but just enough things did work that, you know, you kind of kept going, right? And, and I think that, you know, for me in science, it, it's, you ha I think to be a scientist, to be a bench scientist, you have to be somebody who is, you have to be willing to persevere and you have to be able to come back the next day and, and, and you know, get back in the lab even when something fails and is really disappointing. And uh, you know, the classic story I like to tell about this is a colleague of mine who um, was, uh, I was in, working in the lab, one of the labs I was, where I was uh, in training you know, back in, I was in Colorado. And um, he was a chemist and he was making a compound. And he had spent three months making this compound. And he was finally on you know, step number 15 or something. And he finally had this thing. And he, you know, this compound that he was making, and, and he was uh, drying it down in a glass, you know, flat, kind of a round bottom flask, and it had a star crack in it. And uh, he hooked it up to this, you know, vacuum uh, machine, and it just shattered, you know. And this, this precious compound, three months of his life, just went poof, you know. And, <laughs> and you know, and you can imagine, devastating, right? And, and this guy was just, he was very upset. And, you know, I was, I think I was the only one in the lab. It was kind of late at night, you know, this happened, of course. And, you know, he's, you know, he's very upset, and, uh, you know, so I, I, you know, we tried to kind of console him, and, you know, he went home, and um, the next day, you know, he didn't come in, and I thought, mm, you know, gosh, I wonder if he's, like, decided that science isn't for him. And the next day, I came in, and it was, like, 8 o'clock in the morning, and he was there, and he has lab coat on, and his goggles on, and he was at the hood, and he had something going, and I said, so what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm starting again, step one, you know? And I thought, that is a true scientist. Right? That is, he took a day off, he went, you know, did something else and thought about something else. And then the day after, he's back at the lab and he's back at step one. And, you know, and that's kind of been my history too. Like I, you know, and that's kind of how I work. I, you know, I'll do things in the lab and, or when I, when I was working in the lab, it's been a while now, but, you know, and, and, you know, I would do experiments and a lot of times they wouldn't work and I'd get frustrated and an idea I had would pan, not pan out. But just every now and then something would, you know, kind of click, right? And you'd, you'd say, okay, maybe I'm on the right track and, you know, and I just, you kind of keep going. So I think you have to, you have to be willing to, you know, 
you know, work your way through. You have to be pretty stubborn. I'm a really stubborn person, and it probably helps to be, be that way. And, and I think it helps to have other interests, frankly. You know, I always enjoyed gardening, so I always had a little garden going wherever I lived, even in apartments and things, and even my dorm room, you know. And, uh, and I always had, um, you know, I always other, other kinds of projects that I'd be working on that were completely distinct and different from the lab that kept me going when things in the lab weren't panning out. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Juan Pablo. I, I am a master's in mechanical engineering, but I have no idea about uh, chemistry or biology. I would love to understand more how, how you apply the the replacing or the editing of the DNA to a whole uh, being? Because we, you explained us uh, how is it in one cell, but we have millions of them, so do you have to modify all of them, just a few of them? How does it work? That's a great question. Yeah, so if you want to modify an entire uh, tissue or even a, even a whole uh, plant or animal, then you have to do the editing in cells that are proliferating and are developing into, into that tissue or organism. So we call those stem cells, okay? So um, in a plant, the way it's done is to start with a little ball of tissue that can eventually has the, you know, it's sort of totipotent. It's it has the ability to develop into a whole plant, but it hasn't done that yet. And you can deliver these gene editing molecules into most or all of those cells to make the changes to the DNA that then allow those cells to proliferate and develop into an entire plant. So then you have a plant that has that change in every cell. Um, but you can also do it in, and you can do it in, uh, you can do it in people that way, but you can also do it in, uh, just in, in individual tissue. So in people, for example, for sickle cell disease, the thinking there is that you can take blood stem cells from a person, do the editing, actually in that case it's done in a lab, it's done outside the body, and then the edited cells can then be replaced and they now repopulate the blood supply and you have cells that now all have the edited uh, DNA. So that's how it works. Sure. Yeah. Hi, my Hi. name's Alex. I'm a second year MCV student hoping to major in genetics and I had more of a, I guess, conceptual question, sort of like the last one. Um, something that's always confused me is when I read about these studies where you're trying to genetically modify a, uh, somebody to help them out with a disease, there's certain, I guess, main genes that are targeted. For example, HIV, it's a CCR5 gene, uh, sickle cell anemia, the beta globin gene. I know that there are various other risk genes that also contribute to the disease. It's not always just one gene, even though there's predominantly one that's targeted. So I was wondering how you kind of account for that? And does that mean you genetically edit all of the genes? Do you have data that shows you the associations? And also, for example, I was reading about the CCR5 gene that was modified in China, and they said that that could have also affected cognition. Um, and I was wondering, is how do you also take that into account? And um, yeah. Yeah, it's a super important question, and, and it's definitely um, something that we could, you know, we could discuss for a long time. But I'll just give you a, give you a, a brief uh, answer a couple couple thoughts about that. So first of all, um, this question of you know how many genes do I need to modify to have an effect on a disease or you know sort of whatever phenotype I'm trying to to change. And today, the technology that I talked about tonight is is really best suited, at least in people, for making a single genetic change. So the diseases that most scientists are targeting right now with genome editing for clinical use are diseases that have a very well-documented single genetic cause. And sickle cell disease is a you know, great example of that, but also things like cystic fibrosis is an example of that. Muscular dystrophy is an example of that. Um, Huntington's disease is an example. So these are all uh, diseases that have, that have really well-documented you know, um, genes that are that where a single gene causes disease and could be, in principle, corrected using this kind of a tool. But, um, but you bring up, uh, you know, in the future, I think it'll be possible to, to correct more than one gene at a time. It's already being done in animals like rats and mice and things like that. It's done in plants uh, also to make you know, many changes in, in a plant at one time. So I think as the technology continues to advance, it'll get easier and easier to develop, you know, to alter multiple genes at once. That being said, you brought up another really important point, which is that, you know, genes don't necessarily do just one thing. 
right? They might do multiple things. They might participate in multiple uh, pathways that give rise to different kinds of, of traits. And so you could imagine a situation where you alter a gene that you hope will have a beneficial effect in, in, in one area, but it turns out to have a detrimental effect in some other area, right? And there's a lot of documented examples of that in the research literature. And that raises another, you know, maybe that's another kind of thing I would put in an ethical sort of category, right? Is, you know, how do you, how do you decide uh, what's right to do? And I think it'll really come down to risk and benefit. If you have somebody that is suffering from an acute disease, like sickle cell uh, disease, you might be more willing to, or they might be more willing to make a, a, a change like that um, than uh, somebody who is, uh, you know, has a, has a trait, but it's not really a, a disease, then you might say, well, that's not something I'm going to take a risk on. And I think that, you know, the rare, this area of research right now is really, really active. So there's lots and lots of scientists who are studying, um, you know, human genes and how they interact with each other and genetic pathways for disease as well as genetic pathways that lead to just traits that we observe in ourselves. And so over time, I think we'll also have more and more knowledge about, about that. It'll make it easier to make those decisions. It won't necessarily be easier to separate those functions, though, right? Because that could just be very much intrinsic to our biology. Well, I think, uh, you know, you'll see, I think all of us will see CRISPR uh, coming, coming into our lives increasingly, right? Whether it's uh, through a diagnostic that you might uh, use uh, and, and uh, you know, be able to eventually buy at a, at a drugstore to tell you whether you are infected with a certain kind of uh, bacterium or virus, uh, whether it's uh, eventually having a point of care, uh, or a, a sort of standard of care that involves using a genome editing tool that's a one-and-done kind of treatment for disease, or whether it's going to the you know, store or the local farmer's market and buying uh, fruits and vegetables that have been produced using uh, genome editing to make plants that are robust in their, in their environments. I think we're all going to see increasingly that this is going to be, you know, these kinds of things will be coming into our lives. And so I think it's just important to understand a little bit, at least, about the technology so that you know what's happening and, um, and that you understand, uh, you know, how it affects and, and the choices that you might be making. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.